We Care, a first conversation about justice, is another in the First Conversation series by Megan Madison and Jessica Rowley. The series is designed to help adults talk with children about important subjects like race, gender, consent, grief, and more. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and welcome to the Kids Bookshelf. Ahead, we'll explore the book, and I'll talk with the authors about this series and the inspiration behind it. Jessica Raleigh is an educator and coordinator of early literacy programs at Brooklyn Public Library. And Megan Madison is an early childhood educator who facilitates workshops for teachers on race, gender, and sexuality. And you can learn more about the authors in the description below. Megan and Jessica, welcome to the Kids Bookshelf. Thank you so much for having us. Well, tell us about this series of books and the inspiration behind it. So yeah, First Conversations is a series of books for young children that start early conversations about race, gender, consent, love, bodies, grief, and now justice. And we use concrete language that young children can really get. We hope that adults will use these opportunities and use that language to further discussion um, and to take action in their communities. And all of these topics kind of fall under the same category of things that we believe children are already experiencing, already thinking about, but that grownups um, don't really know how to approach with young children, don't even know if they really have permission to talk about these kinds of things with young children. But these things impact children too. And so we believe that they have the right to have language to describe and to navigate their complex experiences, their feelings, and most importantly, to ask questions and then have those questions answered by the trusted grownups in their lives. So for what age group do you recommend these books for? I might also add that for me, the books grew out of about a decade of working with early childhood educators and families, leading workshops to support them to think about how they might talk about race and racism and white supremacy with young children. And at the end of almost every workshop, um, folks would come up to me and ask what resources I recommend. Um, so when I had the opportunity to kind of meet the minds with Jessica, who is a library professional, the two of us kind of acknowledged the fact that there was really a gap. The resources that families and parents were looking for, that teachers were looking for, didn't yet exist. Um, so when Jessica asked me um, if we might work together and fill that gap, um, I was like, yes. That is something we can do together. So um, our focus is on young children. Um, the books all first came out as board books, and the target age range is ages two to six. And also, we've heard fantastic feedback from parents of very young children, infants and toddlers even, for whom they appreciate having the books because it's an opportunity to practice talking about these topics before the children are old enough to fully understand um, and respond back. And we've also heard from older kids. Um, I was at a book festival this last weekend and a middle schooler was like, these are the best books ever because they were so excited about using these books with the younger children in their lives. Um, and also, you know, when we read them to ourselves as grownups, we also find it a healing experience. So the target age is two to six, but they really are books for everybody of all ages. I was thinking that as, as well, because especially with children who can't read yet, it's going to be an adult that's reading that book. So it seemed like there's an adult audience for this material as well. Did you keep that adult in mind as well when you were writing the books? Yes, definitely. I think we, we've talked a lot throughout the process of writing and then having these books out in the world, how so much of the content in the books is news for grownups as well as, as kids. These are um, ideas that we weren't always taught as as children in my generation, for sure. I'm in my 40s. Um, people weren't talking explicitly about race or gender, or especially not ra like systemic racism um, with me at that age. So, you know, back to what Megan was saying about how we met, you know, 
part of my job is to bring in experts to the library to talk about um, different topics with parents and with educators who are grownups. And so Megan came and led workshops on race and gender. And I was noticing how much it was new information for the grownups in the room, including myself, and how much they wanted to know more. And then some were also like upset that they hadn't learned these things as children and were processing those emotions. Um, me too. And so I think we've seen that as well. We've seen a lot of um, frustration and it manifests in different ways. Sometimes people are like, I'm so upset. I didn't learn this as a child. I'm gonna do better and teach my kids this stuff. And then other people are like, I'm so upset. I didn't learn this as a child and I'm still really not sure if it's true. And there's a lot of pushback um, against some of our books that I think comes from that place of, I'm not sure if this is true because I never learned it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, and for each of the books, you'll notice that um, there's the text and then at the back, there's a section we call the back matter, which breaks down in adult language, each of the key concepts that we touch on in the book. And that really is our way of supporting adults beyond just the words on the page um, to think a little bit of, a little bit more deeply about the topics. We also have a web page that has additional resources for adults who want to learn more and an Instagram page where um, we're always kind of consistently sharing new and updated resources. Um, and I'll also say that that's why the illustrations in the books are so important to us. Um, they're nonfiction texts, so they're conveying information. And also for our younger readers um, who are not yet readers, they're reading the illustrations. Um, and so we were very, very intentional that the illustrations in the book um, are mirroring the content that we're conveying through the words of the books. Well, let's talk specifically about this book. We care. And I want to talk a little bit about the uh, things that I noticed in the illustrations as well. But first of all, tell us about the subject matter you're covering in this book. Justice. We care. A first conversation about justice. Um, this book to me is about abolition. Um, it's about social justice. It's about transformative justice. It's about restorative justice. It's about the many different ways that we can all take part in making the world as it should be for each and every child. What do you think, Jessica? What's this book about to you? Yeah, I think it's about all of those things. And I want to just stop on the word abolition because I feel like that's a new word for a lot of people who are going to be reading the book. And it was new um, for me not long ago. And so I think the way that I talk about abolition with my kids and the way that this book has helped me talk about abolition with my kids is this idea that there are some things in our world, some systems in our society that are so, so broken and we're so used to them being broken and not working that we can't imagine another way or we just accept that they are the way they are. And I think abolition for me with young children is that imagining another way, um, another way that we can care for our communities, another way that we can repair harm when we hurt each other, another way to solve conflict. Um, and we have to have these ideas before we can make them real. So like abolition for me is dreaming with my kids. It's dreaming with the kids at the library. And what's wonderful about that is kids have the best ideas for dreaming and imagining the world as it should be. And I hope that this book um, is a tool for that kind of dreaming. And we give a lot of examples, but we also ask a lot of questions in the book. You may have noticed there are questions embedded throughout that are meant to spark, you know, sort of conversations with parents um, and adults um, around what could the world be? What, how could it be different? I'm talking with Megan Madison and Jessica Rowley about We Care, a first conversation about justice, and our conversation continues in a moment. If you appreciate this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. And thank you. One of the other things I appreciated about the book was that it allowed kids 
to embrace their human nature in that it's okay if you're not perfect all the time. Sometimes you're going to have big emotions, but the thing is not to purposely hurt anyone else and to listen to each other and the importance of people's voices being heard. And uh, one of the things that I noticed obviously purposely done is the difference between the first illustration in the book and the last illustration in the book. Where in the first one, a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's the same between the two, but the big difference is in the first one, it's luxury apartments that are going up. And then in the course of the book, there's town meetings. People talk about what they need in this community, but no one says we need luxury apartments. And then when you get to the end of the book, the luxury apartments are gone and it's a community housing project instead. Yes. Thank you for noticing that. Um, what you were saying, Jessica, about how you describe abolition as the deep brokenness of the world really resonates with me from the Jewish standpoint of tikkun olam. There's a a brokenness in the world and our responsibility, um, the rent we pay for being on this planet is to do our part to repair that brokenness. And also what I've learned doing racial equity work is that many of us have been taught that things like systemic racism are um, aberrational, that they are um, where our criminal justice system, for example, is broken and it just needs repair. And what I appreciate about this book is that it says, no, actually the criminal justice system is working as it is designed to work as it has been designed to work in this country. And what we need is not to reform or repair our broken criminal justice system that is reproducing systemically racist outcomes. We need to transform that system. And that transformation does require imagination that seems in some way um, far off and utopian. And also the transformations that require are super concrete and practical. The example you gave in the illustrations um, with on the first spread, we see a community garden and you're exactly right. There's a um, kind of a construction site with a sign on it that describes new luxury uh, apartments that are going up. The town meeting happens. No one says they want um, luxury apartments. And also the protagonist, uh, a young black girl um, in the illustrations, notices the the problem of poverty and homelessness in the community. Um, And people talk about the need for affordable housing that gets at the root cause of homelessness. And so after an incident where the police in the community sweep an encampment of people who are homeless, um, the community rallies and protests and says, hey, no, housing is a human right. Stop the sweeps. Um, And in response to that direct action, to the community organizing that happens, instead of a luxury apartment building that goes up, it's an affordable housing co-op. And we get to see the um, character, a veteran um, who was formerly homeless in the story, um, by the end of the story, has permanent, stable, affordable housing, housing with dignity in the community. Um, And in some ways, dreaming that up felt like utopia. And also we're seeing right here where we live in New York City, um, the LGBTQ caucus of our city council is putting forward recommendations to radically rethink um, the housing uh, shortage that we have in New York City. So it is utopian and it's also super practical. Um, There are ways that we hope readers are able to get inspiration from the illustrations and take concrete actions now to make their communities places that are more safe and more fair for everybody. I'm curious, the book comes in multiple forms. You can get a hardback version and um, a board book version. Board books typically are are short. Did you have to abbreviate the story or so you have the full text in both versions? Great question. It's the same exact text text and illustrations in both the board book and their picture book format. We love the board book format because it conveys the message that this is a book for young children. Um, It's easier for biting and chewing. It's easier for throwing in the back of the minivan. You don't have to worry about the delicateness of the pages. And also, after a few years of doing this, we heard from teachers who wanted to use the books in their classrooms. And when you're sitting at circle time and doing a read aloud, it can be a little bit easier to have the larger format. Um, So we also published all of the books um, in the picture book format as well. 
Oh yeah, I just wanted to add about the the board book format. I talked earlier about this idea of permission um, to have these kinds of conversations with young children. And I think the format itself just kind of sends that message that this is a book for very young children. And Megan even mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in another podcast and reminded me that we also talk about this idea of, you know, these are hard conversations for some people to have if this is new. Um, and it's also just hard in general to talk to young children because there's a lot of left turns. Um, and so it's nice to read these books with really young children, even babies, before they can respond. It gives you time to practice saying a lot of maybe new vocabulary words or asking these questions that are a little bit challenging before your kid can can talk and respond um, is really, really helpful. I think it's great that it introduces the subjects at an early age. So maybe even like you pointed out before, they might not fully understand it at this point. They're already introduced to the concepts. So as sort of they grow into understanding those concepts, it's not foreign to them. You know, you've already laid the groundwork. Exactly. I showed these books to a group of early childhood um, education students. So people who are going to get their degrees and certification to become uh, preschool teachers and child care workers. Um, and there were a whole range of ages. Maybe the youngest was in her mid-20s and the oldest person in the room was maybe in her mid-60s. Um, and I just asked the room, you know, how would your life be different if you had access to this information when you were two or three or four? And their responses were so powerful. One person talked about um, now in their 30s identifying as non-binary and trans um, and the journey it's taken them to find the language to describe who they are, even though they knew that's who they are their whole life, um, but they didn't have access to that language and vocabulary for themselves or for their community to talk about who they are. And so it was just so powerful for me to hear about their own reflection that they wish they had access to that language so much earlier in life um, because they would have been able to, to talk about and feel good about who they are so much earlier. Well, this is the seventh book in the series, We Care About Justice. Will we see more books in the series? At least one. Um, the next book, A First Conversation About Disability, um, will come out in later 2024 or 2025. Do you know, Jessica? Fall 2025 is it's on schedule um, to come out. Yeah. And, and Megan and I, when we started this process, had a very, very long list of topics that we think young children need access to information about. And so I believe that whether it's going to be in this series or in some other way, um, there will be many more um, books out in the world on these topics. And that's what's been so wonderful since we started the process, you know, almost five years ago. Um, we do a lot of research uh, um, in the kid lit world of what's already being written on these topics. And I think in the five years that we've been writing, there have been so many more books written um, on a lot of these topics. And there's always room for many, many more um, because it's been a long time coming. The other thing I want to mention about this book, and I am sure it's that same, same way with all the books in your series, is that it's deceptively simple. And by that, I mean there's a lot packed in here. You might think it's just going to be surface level, but really there's a lot to absorb, a lot to think about. So it bears reading that book over and over and over again. Uh, actually, I can think of that happening at different stages in the child's life as they're beginning to understand things more thoroughly. And I think it reinforces a lot of things for adults as well. So um, I think it's a, a great resource for parents and for kids. Thank you so much. That means the world to hear, especially from someone like you who spends your time really looking at what's available for kids and families. Thank you. Well, this seventh book in the series is We Care, a first conversation about justice by Megan Madison and Jessica Riley. Megan and Jessica, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Now, if you'd like to purchase We Care, I've placed a link for you in the description below. Thank you for watching this edition of the Kids Bookshelf. 
And if you'd like to see more videos about children's books and their authors, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. And if you're interested in books for young adults and older readers, be sure to check out my Some Books Considered channel, and you'll find a link to that below as well. I'm Dan Skinner. Until next time, keep sharing the gift of reading.